Public health nursing is a little bit of everything. I'm a clerk, a salesman, a diplomat. We do many things, for our clinics are all specialized. Wednesday afternoons, for instance, we only see expectant mothers. But each one is a different problem, because each one is a different person. They feel they're special too, and always seem amazed when they discover they have something in common with the other women. But that's natural. After all, we all think of our health problems as personal problems. The Well Baby Clinic on Tuesdays and Fridays is a real all-star performance. I've gotten so that I could write a book about every baby that I handle. I know who's ticklish and who responds to cooing. I know what he weighed last month and what his father wants him to be when he grows up. His mother and I are old friends. That's the way it ought to be. But it wasn't always that way. When I first came to the clinic, I used to get annoyed at the way people behaved. After all, we were trying to help them. You think they do their share. They were all just cases to me in those days. TBs with numbers and histories. I had been trained to respect facts. And facts were things that could be understood or seen. A lung spot, for instance. It's there on the x-ray plate. A change in weight. You can calculate it by simple subtraction. I was proud of my facts in those days. I used to see the other nurses the old-timers, like Mrs. Jensen, fussing with the patients. I would hear her talking to them about their feelings. Encouraging them to complain, it seemed to me. I felt superior, because I didn't waste time and energy getting involved with patients, as I put it. I thought of nurses like Mrs. Jensen as old-fashioned. Small talk seemed so unscientific. Besides, there was no time for chit-chat with the pressure of the caseloads we were carrying. Just getting through the day was a miracle. Then one day, I came up against a situation that my science couldn't cope with. I had gone out with the other girls that morning headed for the schools and factories and homes where we did our field work. This day, though, was a tough one for me. And by the afternoon, I was tired and cross. Besides, my last visit was a long ride up to Craryville, one of our suburbs furthest out, just to persuade a patient to come to see the doctor. Delivering a personal invitation, no less. It was a tedious trip. Through the outskirts and past the mining section, the patient was a miner's wife, and I had plenty of time to stew over the situation. I was going at the suggestion of Miss Roberts, my supervisor, but I can't say I thought it was a good idea. This patient was pregnant, and had been referred to our clinic three months before by her doctor. Now I had to go all the way out to her home because she had broken her appointment again and again. Even though she was in perfect health, as far as I could make out. Well, by the time I got there, I had decided to be as pleasant and polite as possible. After all, a call is a call. Good afternoon, Mrs. Peters. I'm Miss Burke from the health center. I sent you a card because I couldn't contact you by telephone. Yes, I know. I got your card this morning. Well, aren't you going to ask me to come in? Well, all right. I guess you can come in. This place is kind of a mess. Oh, it looks fine to me. 
But I'm afraid you can't stay long. My husband's coming home soon. Oh, don't worry about that, Mrs. Peters. I'm used to husbands. We get along fine. What I really came to talk to you about was your coming to the center. We thought if you wouldn't come to us, that we'd come to you. Dr. Martin thinks it's important that you come back now for whatever help we can give you. You are coming, aren't you? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? It's terribly important, both for you and the baby. Childbirth is safer nowadays only because we know so much more about it. And because if we're properly warned, we can take precautions. That's why we want you to come in now. It's the only way to prevent trouble, really, Mrs. Peters. You want to stay well, I'm sure. You do want your baby to be healthy and happy. I know that. You do want your baby, don't you, Mrs. Peters? Yes. Well, then you really must come to clinic. Can I put you down the calendar for tomorrow at 10 o'clock? I don't know. You don't know? Really, Mrs. Peters? You I'm have... sorry. You'll have to go now. My husband will be coming home any minute, and I don't want him to see you here. But you don't understand. You can't wait any longer. You have... Go away. Quick, please. But, Mrs. Peters, I just wanted to... Hello, Mary. Oh, hello, Jack. What's the matter? Well, nothing's the matter. This is Miss Burke from the health center. What's the matter? Are you sick? Is she sick? No, not at all. She's fine. Just a routine visit. Just a routine visit. She was just leaving. You go ahead and wash up. Yes, I was just leaving, really. Goodbye. Thanks for stopping in. Well, you can imagine my feelings at that point. I was so mad I could hardly get back into the car. Here was I, miles out of my way to help this woman and that, that husband of hers, of all the inconsiderate people. I was giving the Peters back to Miss Roberts on a platter. When he came in, she practically pushed me out. And I had to say routine visit. What else could I do under the circumstances? You can imagine how I felt. Yes, I can. It must have been a really difficult interview. I wonder what went wrong. Nothing went wrong. It's just that this woman is stubborn and stupid. She won't lift a hand to help herself. Well, maybe. But it does sound as though something is really troubling her. I don't know. I tried to be as pleasant as I could be. I know you did. This is a question of some basic attitude toward medical help. You just happened to run smack into it. I sure did. And I must admit it, now I'm stumped. I don't know how to get Mrs. Peters to come in here. It does sound hard. Well, what shall I do? I don't know. But of course you do. This sort of thing must happen often. Yes, it does. But it's a different story every time. Well, can't you tell me what to do this time? Couldn't you come to see her with me? You're such a good talker. I'm sure that wouldn't help you with Mrs. Peters. She's a person, and she's refusing to come here for, for her own reasons. They may have nothing to do with anybody else's reasons. But can't you help me at all? I'll do anything I can to help. But I haven't got any easy formula that you can solve a problem as complicated as this one may be. There's nothing for us to do but to work it out on its own, on its own facts and with its own people. And you know these people better than I do now. But I don't understand them. They don't seem to say what they mean. People rarely do. Here, this is Mrs. Henderson's day. Let's call her in and talk to her about it. Francis, can we see you for a moment? Thanks. This is a perfect problem for a nurse mental health consultant to help us with. I'm sorry, Francis. We are sort of rushing you. That's all right. You know Miss Burke. 
She's our newest staff member. How do you do, Miss Burke? How do you do, Mrs. Henderson? I thought we'd catch you before you got busy with other things. It's a patient of Miss Burke's, an antepartum patient who's resisting all help. Go ahead. Well, the patient has refused to make any clinic appointments. Yesterday, Miss Burke had a bad time when she went out to see her. What was wrong? We don't know yet. She says she wants her baby, but is refusing to make any appointments. Does she mean that, Miss Burke? Is it your opinion that she really wants the baby? Yes, it is. That's what's so funny. I think she'd rather die than not have a baby. Really? I'd like to hear more about her. How old is the patient? Well, she's 28, the wife of a checker at the Johnson Mine. This is Mrs. Henderson time. asked if I would mind her discussing my case at the staff conference. I said, not at all. I thought we should take some stand on uncooperative patients. But the other nurses seemed to look for reasons to excuse Mrs. Peters. But that wouldn't explain the husband's attitude. What's the husband got to do with it? She's the one that's refusing to come to clinic. He can't stop her if she wants to come. I don't know, but it sure sounds as though she's scared of him. What do you think, Miss Burke? Have you any other impressions about how she felt? Maybe she's scared. She didn't say so. I don't know. They're mostly all scared, but lots of them would never admit it. I've known the most terrified ones to put on the bravest show. Maybe she is frightened, but somehow I don't think it's about having a baby. Maybe it's something else. Maybe she doesn't realize what she's doing. Well, if she doesn't, it's because she doesn't want to. Miss Burke seems to have told her so very emphatically. Maybe a little too emphatically. She could hardly have missed it. I guess that's true. Do you think she wants to hurt herself? Punish the baby too? I don't think she wants to hurt the baby. That's what I don't understand. She seems to want the baby. Or at least she says so. I'd like to go back to the father again. Maybe if she's really afraid of having a child, she's blaming him for the situation she's in. Yes. Then neglecting herself and the baby could be a kind of unconscious revenge. Sounds far-fetched to me. The way you see it, she hates her husband and hurts herself. That might happen. I've seen it before. But there's no indication in this case of such a personality pattern. Mrs. Peters doesn't seem to be generally self-destructive from what we've heard. It's only in this particular matter that she appears to be hurting herself. Or have we any other signs that she hates Mr. Peters? She's afraid, maybe. I rather agree with you. It's not hate. I know it's not. I mean, I don't think that's the way Mrs. Peters felt about her husband. She kept turning away from him as though she wanted to hide something. Not as if she hated him. Hide me, maybe. No, I know what it was. Hide the baby. That's the way she acted. Now I see it. I think she doesn't want her husband to know she's having a baby. That must be it. I'm sure of it now. That's why she's afraid. That's why she wanted me to leave before he came. It's so simple. But I was so mad I couldn't see it. I just reacted to her rudeness. I guess I just didn't think about her feelings. I was so afraid I was messing everything up. That's not unnatural. I feel sure now that it's Mr. Peters who doesn't want the baby. That's why she seems so alone. Well, it's something to look into. Better be careful, though. It's just a possibility at this point. Why don't you drop around there again? It takes a long time to get to know people, or to get them to know you. I certainly will. I'll go tomorrow. You understand that, girl, and I think you're doing exactly the right thing. I know it's not as easy as it looks. The trouble is that she tries too hard to make people do what she wants them to do. She's so eager and so full of energy. Yes, but she's warm and real. She's a nurse. But what about Mrs. Peters? She is being pushed around a bit. She was. I think Susan caught on to quite a lot this afternoon. She's still out to do or die. Yes, and she'll go on making mistakes. You know it and I do. But one, they won't be very serious mistakes. Two, she can't learn without making them. And three, she's upset about the case. A good sign, especially when it means she'll be coming to see you quite often. That's just what I mean. I'm not sure I, I am. I'll see you on the 18th. I want to hear how it turns out.
Bye. By now, the case had become a challenge. Eager beaver, I went out to attack. No, really, go ahead and finish up. I know how it is. There's so much to be done. It was really awful of me day before yesterday, barging in on you just when you want to get your husband's supper. I'm sorry, really, I am. Oh, it's all right. I'll have these dried in just a minute. Now, take your time. It's just that I was so anxious to see you come back to clinic. I'm afraid I wasn't very thoughtful. I know, it's all right. I'm sorry. I couldn't help thinking about you alone out here all day. And now that you're going to have a baby, Maybe you're a little worried about it. Is that it, do you think? I don't know. Mrs. Peters, do you think you feel afraid of having a baby? Maybe a little. You haven't told your husband about it yet, have you? Yes, I told him. I told him right away when I was sure. You did? Really? But I don't think it was a very good idea. Why not? He doesn't want a baby. Are you sure? Did he say so? No, not exactly, but I'm oh, alive. I'm sorry, Mrs. Peters. Really, I am. Here, now, don't cry. Maybe you're just jumping to conclusions. Men don't always understand these things at first. Perhaps if I talk to him. No, I don't think so. It wouldn't do any good. You don't know. Know what? Mrs. Peters, sit down over here with me a minute. Tell me what I don't know. Well, I'll try. You see, it's not simple. That's why I didn't tell you before. You see, this isn't the first time I've expected a baby. Oh. And the last time, everything went wrong. Jack was all excited at first. He seemed to want the baby more than I did, if anybody could. He got another job in his spare time. He helped around the house. It was wonderful. And then I got sicker and sicker. And, and then, almost at the end of the ninth month, the baby was born dead. You'd think it was the end of the world for Jack. For weeks, we could hardly talk at all. And since then, we never talk about babies. But that doesn't mean he doesn't want one. Oh, but he doesn't. When other people talk about children, he gets mad and shuts up like a clam. Almost a year ago, I kind of asked him about our having one, and again, for a week, he was all upset. It's no use. It's just no use. Well, maybe you're right. But does that mean he can't change? You don't know Jack. He's not the kind to change. Well, let's not worry about that now. This thing is going to happen whether your husband approves or not. Maybe when the baby's born, Jack will see. Of course he will. And in the meantime, you should stop worrying about him and start taking care of yourself. You will come to clinic tomorrow with three. I guess so. Please, Mrs. Peters, I really understand now, and I'm sure I can help you. We'll do this thing together, you and I. And there she was at three the next day. I was so happy. And remember how dead set she was against coming? Last week, I was absolutely sure I couldn't do a thing. Now everything has changed. It's really wonderful. Don't you think so? Mm-hmm. Except... Yes? Well, there's just one thing. After all, the most important fact, of course, is that Mrs. Peters is coming here. Without that, we couldn't do a thing. But... But? Well, this may sound silly. But I don't think Mrs. Peters is nearly as happy about all this as I am. I saw her several minutes after her examination, and she sort of broke down again and cried, even after Dr. Martin told her everything was going fine. Well, that's not so strange, considering her previous resistance. I think there's something else wrong, something really wrong that we're not touching. Like what? Well, I think she's coming to like me, Trust me, but it's as though that weren't enough. There's something I'm not doing. I do wish I knew what it was. Maybe it's not you. The one who isn't doing, I mean. I don't understand. Well, you seem to have been doing a great deal. I'm sure Mrs. Peters feels your support and your acceptance, or she wouldn't have come here. Then what's wrong? There are very few women who can face the fact of approaching childbirth without a 
great need for reassurance and support. But they need that reassurance from a special person. Having a baby is a job for two people, in more than just the biological sense. Don't you think, perhaps, that the one who isn't doing enough, as you put it, is Mr. Peters and not you? As a matter of fact, maybe you're doing a little too much. Maybe you're going a little too far in helping Mrs. Peters do without her husband. That baby is going to be a lot of years growing up. Husband isn't a bad person to have around. But he's impossible. He refuses to accept reality. Are you sure? That's what I gather. He refuses to talk to me. Well, have you tried talking to him? Well, my chance came by luck, more or less, the following week. I put my name on the list for field duty with the mobile unit that was x-raying miners at that time. I was sure it was a chance to visit a real mine. And Miss Roberts thought it was good for me to see the TB control program at first hand. And I must admit, I enjoyed the change. The x-ray unit was a beauty. But when we got there, I immediately realized this was the place where Mrs. Peter's husband worked, a coal mine called Flower Hill. He wasn't around, and I wondered if I did meet him, should I talk to him. You see, I hadn't cleared with Mrs. Peters. First chance I got, I looked to see if his name was on the appointment list. Meantime, trying to decide what to say to him. I'm not sure whether I was disappointed or pleased not to find it. At least the problem didn't have to be solved now. there was plenty to do when we worked through the morning. Must have handled more than 30 an hour. And each one had to be told it wouldn't hurt. Those big, tough miners. I never did find Mr. Peters. He found me. Excuse me, miss. You remember me? I'm Peters. You were at my house a couple of weeks ago. Of course I remember you, Mr. Peters. I'm glad to see you. Excuse me for talking to you now, but I figured it was better to grab a chance than to lose it altogether. Well, what do you mean? Well, that evening when you were over, I, I'd had a bad day here at the mine, and I was kind of beat when I got home. Mrs. Peters, all upset and worried, well, I guess I wasn't very polite. I, I'm sorry I acted that way. I didn't mean nothing personal. No kidding. There's nothing to be sorry about. Stand completely. There's nothing to apologize about. How's your wife? Oh, about the same, thanks. Pretty good. Well, uh, thanks again for taking it like that. I, I guess I better not interrupt you anymore. Oh, by the way, Mr. Peters, if you have another minute, I'd like to talk to you. Well, sure, I got a minute. It's 15 minutes before the whistle. Well, then, let's go into the infirmary. I won't keep you long. There's something that's been bothering me, too. And I'd like to take this opportunity to talk to you about it. Well, sure, what is it? Well, as a matter of fact, it's a rather personal matter about your wife. We were looking over her medical history and came across this trouble she had three years ago. You know, the time she was going to have a baby. Mrs. Peters seems to have forgotten a number of the details about her accident, and Dr. Kenyon, who treated her, is dead now. I thought you just might be able to help me. I don't know anything. I thought you might remember when she began to get sick. I can't remember. That's too bad. I was hoping you could help us. You see, now that Mrs. Peters... We can't have babies. The babies are born dead. No, Mr. Peters. I think you just don't understand. 
Dr. Martin says that you and Mrs. Peters can have babies. As a matter of fact, you're going to have one right now. <laughs> no, not us. But really, Dr. Martin has examined your wife very carefully. Mrs. Peters is going to have a baby. And from everything we know, without much trouble. Dr. Kenyon said no. I think Dr. Kenyon meant that Mrs. Peters couldn't have that baby. Not that she could never have babies. Sometimes the first one is harder, you know. But that doesn't mean she can never have them. Are you sure? You're not just telling me this. No, Mr. Peters. Everything points to a safe delivery. But what about her? Last time Doc Kenyon said she nearly died. I was lucky, he said. There haven't been any complications this time. Why do you think she's in danger? I thought we couldn't have a baby. That's what I thought. All these years, I, I thought something was wrong. Maybe me, maybe my wife. Doesn't make any difference who if something's wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if she died and it was because she was she was sick inside or something, it'd be my fault. And that's too big a chance to take. But Mrs. Peters is in fine shape. It's hard for me to believe. Miss, <laughs> I don't even know your name. I'm Susan Burke. Miss Burke. You don't know the kind of news you're telling me. I don't know why I, I wanted that baby more than anything else in the world. And when that happened, I, I just kind of never got over it. I, I got tied up. I, I got mad every time I thought about it. Maybe it's because I thought never. Maybe because I, I was afraid Mary would die. I don't know. I, I can't talk to you about it anymore. I understand. It isn't important to talk to me. But I do hope you can talk to Mrs. Peters. We can do a lot to help her. But she needs you. She's a little scared about all this, too, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know. Soon after that, Mrs. Peters started attending our classes for expectant mothers. I'd been informed of her coming, of course, but I'd been out with the mobile unit for two weeks. And then I was busy catching up on my work. So it was three weeks, actually, before we met face to face again. Oh, Miss Burke! I'm so glad to see you. Hello, Mrs. Peters. I've been wanting to tell you the news. It's so wonderful. I've been wrong about Jack. He wants a baby. He's crazy about it now. I'm not surprised. Everything in the house seemed changed last night. It was like when we first came to live there when we got married. We talked about having children, and Jack was kind of grumbling, but not at all like he has been. And when I mentioned picking a name for this one, he, he got all funny again, you know, all tight and not talking, but it won't last. I know it won't. It, something has happened to him. I'm glad, Mrs. Peters. But it's you I have to thank for everything. <laughs> not quite. We did have a bad time for a while, but later, all I did was clear up a serious misunderstanding. You and Mr. Peters wanted the same thing all the time. You just didn't know it. It was a boy, that first Peters child, a fine, lively youngster. Hardly ever see him anymore. He's outgrown well, baby. But there are plenty of new ones to take his place. Sure, science is the important thing. But the doctors all know you can't just stick to the numbers when you're dealing with people. They see quite a lot when they listen through a stethoscope. I learned way back on the Peters case, and I still learn it every time I go on duty. It's mighty hard to weigh or calculate the fears and tensions that are hidden in the human beings I deal with. I just try to remember every minute, every second, that feelings are facts, too.